We appreciate so much that many of you in other time zones have stayed up late to join us. Now onto the agenda. We have a busy lineup, including three sessions. Session one uh, consists of three speakers covering the global landscape. David Crotty from OUP will moderate. In session two, Sarah Nusser, professor of statistics at Iowa State University, will share challenges and progress around ensuring public access to research data. In session three, we'll have a conversation on the state of public access, the US funder perspective, moderated by Brooks Hansen from AGU with an esteemed panel of funder representatives. Uh, now, before we move on, I wanna mention a few housekeeping items. We will record the event for those who cannot attend live. All attendees will join in listen-only mode. Speakers and moderators will turn their microphones and cameras on at the appropriate time. We'll have time for questions at the end of each session. Please type your questions in the Q&A um, box, which is at the icon on the bottom of your screen. If you see a question you feel is important, you can upvote it by clicking the thumbs up icon to the left just below the question. And that will raise the question to the top, towards the top of the queue. Staff will read questions to the speakers and we'll try to include as many as possible, but can't guarantee we'll get to them all. We will conduct a very short poll during the forum and you can find the link to the poll also in the chat window. We'd appreciate your completing the poll at some point during the forum and we'll share the results um, before the end of the event today. Finally, many thanks to our sponsors whose generous contributions have made the event possible. At the platinum level, APS and ACM, Gold, ACS, AIP Publishing, AMS, Geoscience World and SAGE, and of course, AGU and the Company of Biologists. Without further ado, please enjoy the event and I'll pass the baton to David Crotty. Okay, um, thanks Alex. Um, welcome everybody. i um, going to introduce our first session and, uh, by thinking about um, evolution. And over the last 350 years or so, we've seen this steady evolution in the way that we communicate uh, research results through published papers. Um, and, and I like that evolution metaphor because I'm a former biologist and that's how I tend to think about large systems uh, changing over long periods of time. Um, something I've been thinking about a lot lately <coughs> are, are these two sort of competing theories of how evolution works, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, that came up in the 1970s. And, and the first is gradualism, which is the more traditional view. Um, that evolution is always happening. It's, it's this slow, steady change, continuous change over time. And a new theory was raised back then called punctuated equilibria. And, and that theory suggests that species tend to become stable and enter this, set, this sort of state of stasis with very little change happening until a big event in the environment happens. And then there's this big sudden uh, uh, period of rapid change. Um, now, one of my favorite parts of the story is that, that these sort of arguments back then became so contentious that, uh, uh, and, fr and sort of factionalized that the, the gradualists would refer to punctuated equilibria with its sudden rapid shifts as, as evolution by jerks. And um, uh, the, the punctuated equilibria people would refer to gradualism with its slow, steady movement as evolution by creeps. Um, but you know, regardless of, of these sort of unflattering nicknames for different factions, um, I really like this as a, uh, as a framework for where we are today in terms of open access and, and the larger picture of open science. Uh, for the last you know, 20 odd years, um, we, we've generally been in a fairly stable system uh, with these sort of gradualist, gradual changes over a much longer time period than I think anybody would have, uh, would have uh, hoped for. Um, and I would argue that we have now entered into one of these uh, punctuated periods where there are enormous geological events happening that are driving a much more rapid state of change. Um, the end goal here, uh, better spread of knowledge and information is both obvious and compelling to pretty much every stakeholder in the ecosystem. Um, but the, the journey, and you know, to, to, to add a further metaphor to confuse things, uh, uh, the journey is still going to be something of a bumpy ride. And today with this session, I, I, wanna, I want us to get a sense of where we are on that trip 
and what we can expect on the road ahead. Um, we're going to start with a, a look at the big picture from Dan Pollack, who's the Chief Digital Officer of Delta Think. Um, and then we will look at two enormously important regions that are shaping research policy globally. Um, first, Alicia Wise, the Director of Information Power, uh, Director at Information Power, is going to offer a look at the EU and the UK. And Yasushi Ogasaka, Director of the Department of Research and Development for Future Creation at the Japan Science and Technology Agency will talk about their efforts to drive open science. Um, we will take you know, questions throughout this, please type them in and we'll have a session and we should have time for uh, questions and discussion at the end. So now I will turn things over to Dan. Hello everyone. Um, so my name's Dan Pollock uh, and uh, as David said, I've been asked to set some context for today's forum by looking at how widespread the use of open access is. I'm operating here uh, in, with my affiliation uh, to Delta Think. Um, Delta Think is an independent scholarly communications consultancy and we provide independent advice across the scholarly publishing community. So that's to both publishers on the one hand and library stroke consortia on the other, if you like. Of relevance here is that we've collated and cross-referenced uh, a data set about the scholarly journals market from a number of sources and we can use this data to look into some, uh, some trends. So what I'd like to cover, next slide please, um, is to look at how much stuff is open access and how it might vary depending on your perspective and then also we'll spend a little bit of time looking at uh, what we think is the key influencer of open access uptake, which are policies and mandates. So if we move on to the next slide, before we get into any numbers, however, it's very important to get our definitions clear because the same term is often used to mean different things to different people. And the analogy I draw here is uh, how the term walkies might be taken between your dog and your cat. Your dog feels that walkies is a life affirming essential event your cat doesn't do walkies, which is a sign of enslavement and beneath its dignity. And so, next slide, we find when talking about open access, the term open access can mean a variety of different things. And so to get things clear here, we will use open access to follow its formal definition, if you like. In other words, research articles that are online and published both free of charge to read, and also free of restrictions to reuse. Um, and it's both of those things that uh, are important for, for articles to be considered open access. We compare and contrast that with what we term to be public access, which means the article may be free of charge to read, but is not free of reuse restrictions. So if move to the next slide, please. Um, it's worth noting that um, some sources will use open access to cover both of these definitions. For example, many of you may be unfamiliar with unpay or maybe familiar with unpaywall, which gathers data about articles open access status. Um, and unpaywall data is used by pretty well all the major indexes now, Web of Science, Scopus, Dimensions. We use it. I know many academics use it as well. Um, and the team at Unpay will indeed use open access to cover both aspects, both sort of capital O, capital A open access and public access. And indeed they've coined the term bronze open access to mean what we would term public access. Um, that bronze stroke public component is also uh, consistent with the current OSTP public access mandate. Now point is simply this, that to open access advocates, bronze open access might be considered oxymoronic as it doesn't include this free to reuse component. So whilst we don't advocate any particular nomenclature, as observers, we have to be clear about the differences between different sources um, because these sorts of details do indeed matter. So how much open access stuff is there? Well, according to a recent tweet by Unpaywall's Jason Priam, just over half of it and about 53% of articles published are quote open access but of course that's according to that unpaywall definition which is the much broader one in, in including both public and open so what we've done is we've dived into that data a bit more to pull apart its constituent uh, components and if we move on to the next slide thank you um, when we do that we actually get some rather different results 
So what we're seeing here is the proportion of indexed scholarly output. So it's basically in Scopus or Web of Science. Over time, uh, we, we're, we're therefore excluding content that might lie in predatory journals, for example. And we're showing how the proportions of that output breaks down by the different access types. I should also add that we are excluding content that's not available um, from publishers platform. So this is publishers stuff, if you will. We're showing the data over time and I'll speak to that trend in a minute. So for now, please just focus on the rightmost bar showing 2019. And here we'll see the proportion of quote, open stuff, unquote, drops from that 53% down to just below 40% in our narrower focus sample. And this is comprised roughly of 10% of uptake in Brown, which is public access, um, 20 or so percent uptake, which is open access in fully open access journals. So think PLOS One scientific report. This is in, including the reuse component. So that's the yellow bars, 22% or so. And then finally, open access in hybrid, shown in blue, uh, is around about five to 6% of output with the remaining 60% or so behind some sort of paywall. So that's how we'd see the stuff uh, breaking out. Um, but it is important to notice that we are using a different sample um, focus. And if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, just to further explore that, if we look at just the gold bars, so this is the open access stuff in fully open access journals. Um, I want to dwell on that for a little bit because it, it speaks to policies and mandates from funders such as the Wellcome Trust, or the Gates Foundation, or Europe's Plan S, of course, is pushing towards that, that fully open access world. And if we look at just that subset, for our indexed output, as I said, about 22% of output falls on, under that category, that proportion would increase to around about 30% if we include all the research output, including the non-indexed stuff but it would fall to below 20% if we further narrowed our scope to include just the major publishers. And indeed, if you were a society publisher, you might see a different proportion, as you would if you were in a different discipline. If we move to the next slide, we'll see how these numbers look for social sciences. And here, just around 16, 1.6% of output in social sciences would class as open access output, in fully open access journals. So that's almost in relative terms about 30% less than the indexed average. The point is that um, sample size and focus really does matter. So next slide, please. Um, we could carry on dicing and slicing things um, until the cows come home, as it were, we could look at hybrid, we could look at uh, all, all sorts of um, different journals. And quickly, there was a question ab about whether these cover English language journals, they cover everything. Um, basically, the, the underlying on paywall data set uh, covers anything that has a DOI attached to it and is classified as a journal article. So I hope that addresses the question. Um, but the key takeaway, I think, from this data is, is that um, you really need to run analysis that's specific to your area of interest, your publishing model, your discipline, in order to get the sort of results that might be relevant to you. However, what I will say is that as a general rule, the more inclusive and the broader the geographic scope, the more open access there is. And the more, or the less inclusive, so the more indexed, or if you focus just on, on say, larger publishers, or you move your geography to the wealthier nations. So as you narrow that focus, you'll get less open access coming out. And that's the sort of very general rule on that. Next slide, please. However, whatever your definition and focus, one constant does seem to be coming out of the data. And that is that the proportion of open access in general has been growing over time. Um, the reason that the most recent year, that's 2019, is off trend is simply down to embargoes. Quite a lot of content may come off embargo over the coming six to 12 months. It will move, therefore, from the gray bit into one of the other colors, and we would expect the 2019 data to come back on trend in due course. Again, quite a bit of detail behind that statement. We don't have time to get into it here, but I just wanted to at least to call that out in case people were wondering about the trends. So next question, uh, next slide, please. Um, this then begs the question, what's influencing the growth of all this? Uh, and, and I think here we get to the notion of open access mandates and policies. And I'd like to just dive into that very briefly. 
Here we're looking at data from raw map, which I think provides a very good read on that. Across the bottom, the red lines represent years and each bar is a quarter's worth of data. So we're basically running from 2005 on the left through to 2020 on the right. And we're looking at the numbers of policies out there. Uh, there's about a thousand or so registered now. The lion's share of those thousand or so, about 78% are produced by universities or research institutes. They're the pale blue so-called research organizations. Another 8% or so of policies are coming from funders. And then there's a nuance in the dark green. It's a combined category, uh, sort of combined funders and research organizations. Um, and those might include the constituent organizations of something like a Plan S. You won't actually find Plan S elucidated as such in this data, um, but the organizations that participate uh, may account for, for all, all those sorts of organizations may account for a further 5% of policies or so. Um, and you can see things are growing over time. And then next slide, please. We can also um, explore the geographical spread of policies from raw maps data set. And that's what we're getting into here. Very briefly, the color coding varies depending on the chart, but top left, you'll find the wealthiest economies uh, tend to have the most policies. So the dark blue there, top left, um, with Europe leading the charge. Top right, we can break that down further um, into, if you like, sub-territories. Color coding uh, is different, but basically I think it's the wealthier nations. If you look at Northern Europe, Western Europe, North America, add those up and they seem to account for um, the single largest proportion of, of policy numbers. And then finally, the raw map data allows you to break stuff out by country. And that's what's shown in the bars on the bottom. So for example, the US is the one country with the single largest number of mandates in it with the UK trailing a close second with just a maybe 10% fewer mandates. Although interestingly, the UK only spends one tenth of its uh, uh, GDP on, on uh, research and development. So um, quite a difference there. So there's some interesting nuances we can find on policies, excuse me, coming out of um, uh, the uh, raw map data. And if we then move on to the next slide, um, please. Um, Finally, I, I like to highlight a study that's recently come out in PRJ, which is looking at the uptake of open access by universities worldwide. And that might enable us to see if there's any sort of relationship between the kind of policies that we've just seen and the actual use of open access. Um, the chart here shows one dot per university. The dots are grouped in terms of countries. So the countries are listed down the left. For example, you'll see the United Kingdom right at the top there. And then across the, the horizontal axis is the proportion of university papers published by some sort of open model. So that might be public access or open access. And really what we see is that there's quite a spread of stuff. I and mean, the paper goes into a lot of detail. We're not really gonna be able to dive into it here, but very briefly, the UK leads the world in terms of uh, open access adoption and if you dive into the data behind all this you'll find a lot of that's driven by so-called green policies which reflects the UK's centralized and localized mandate. Um, European and North American countries tend to have above median uptake of open access. The red vertical dotted line is the median uptake. So, so North European and North America tend to sort of use more open access and average as it were, compare and contrast, let's say with uh, the, the Asian countries that have a lower than median use of open access. Um, and we could continue diving into detail. For example, Brazil, which is the, the brighter green about a, a third of the way down from the top, uh, has a lot of open access in fully open access journals, so AKA gold, and that reflects its localized mandates promoting the Cielo program and so on. Um, so the, the paper's worth a read and it does call out that, yes, there may be relationships, but also there, there are, are exceptions and, 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 and pockets as well. So next slide, please. Um, the, the measures of open access won't, or, or discussions on open access and open access policies won't be complete without two final things. One uh, is the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the US, the OSTP. It currently has a public access mandate. We know that is also currently under review, so really we can't comment more. And unless there's, there's been some breaking news in the last five minutes, I'm not aware of any major changes to report on. And the next slide, please. We also have Europe's Plan S. 
Um, I don't want to steal from Alicia's thunder here, but I would point out that Plan S funders account for less than 1% of global spending on research and development, but they influence between around 4 and 5% of articles published. And that multiplier or amplifier effect, I think, boils down to multi-author papers. If just one author in a multi-author paper is funded by a Plan S funder, then essentially the whole paper has to become Plan S compliant. So you get to see this multiplier effect. And in actual fact, for the very, very highly cited journals, maybe up to a third, almost 29% or so, of their papers may fall under Plan S funding and therefore may need to be made compliant as, as those mandates uh, roll out. So just a, a little nuance around Plan S there. So final slide, please, just to wrap up. We've looked at how we need to be very clear about our definitions and in particular be aware of the public access versus formal open access definitions and how some sources will, will, will combine those two definitions. We've seen how different sample sizes can lead to very different uh, numbers um, and also we, we've dived into some of the mandates and policies. My takeaway message again really is that you need to run analyses tailored to your situation because the numbers do vary so much depending where you are in the world, the disciplines you're looking at, the sort of publishing you do. And with that, I will hand pass the baton back um, to David, I think, or, or, or the next speaker. And thank you very much for your time. Yeah, that's, thanks, Dan. Um, let's move on to Alicia. Are you, are you ready, Alicia? Your slides look like they're up, so we're good to go. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to join today. I've been asked to um, talk about open access in Europe. Uh, Dan's already started us with some definitions. Uh, Europe sometimes needs a definition as well. Here I'm thinking very broadly, uh, not only the, the countries in the European Union itself, but those of us who are in transition and um, also the, the broader uh, range of countries that are uh, united by culture, by geography, by history. So broadly speaking, um, and this is a, a, a broad generalization, but just to orientate us, Southern and Eastern Europe, and Denmark for some reason as well, have long been primarily focused on green open access. Um, which is where a near final draft of an article is shared publicly, perhaps through a repository, for example. While Northern Europe, except for Denmark, for whatever reason, has been more broadly focused on gold open access, where the publishing costs are paid up front, and so the publisher makes the final version of the article available with a, a clear reuse license. So there's some um, historical differences in emphasis in open access. But as we move to the next slide, please, Howard, um, it's really important to um, emphasize at the outset that despite these sorts of nuances and differences, there's actually quite a strong focus um, throughout Europe on achieving um, open access and helping to accelerate um, movement toward full open access, at least for Europe's outputs, but ideally more broadly globally. So it's not really possible to understand what's going on with open access in Europe by only looking at funder policies. It's really essential to also think about how other stakeholder groups, universities and their libraries, and researchers themselves are thinking um, about uh, these changes and um, how they interrelate with one another. It's also really important to understand that the drivers for change operate at different levels of granularity um, within countries and across the continent. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how these spheres interact for you. In, in general, Europe, um, a bit differently from the United States, um, we see strong uh, funding uh, from governments, uh, both for research but also for university infrastructure, um, including information and, and information services. So library budgets in various ways are influenced directly by the amounts of money available from funders for research. Um, the other thing perhaps to say is that funding uh, for access to publications and now increasingly for publishing services themselves 
come from libraries uh, representing their universities and from consortia of libraries. So it's both the funder policies where they're putting their money, but also where university libraries are putting their emphasis during negotiations and their money that publishers really need to be very mindful of. Um, right, the other thing to say in setting some context is that sometimes funders are giving money for open access publishing to an individual researcher through a grant and then they can use that money as they will for um, article processing charges or whatever but oftentimes funders in europe are actually passing their money for open access publishing services through universities through libraries and research offices that means that the funders in universities in Europe, perhaps more than in some other parts of the world, are kind of aligned in both trying to drive up the amount of open access, but also in con constraining costs in achieving value for money as they do so. Okay, um, let us go to the next slide, please, Howard. And um, I'm going to give you three case studies from France, Germany, and the UK, just to give you a sense of the different nuances and flavors. In France, there's a national plan for open access and open science, but it's all about open infrastructure um, and services that are developed by the research community and that are owned and governed by the research community. So there are repositories galore, some at universities and others operating nationally. For example, the HAL um, repository, which is a cross-disciplinary national service bringing together content um, from uh, researchers right across France from all subject areas. You also see a lot of uh, government grants and funding available for scholar-led publishing um, operations. So you find a lot of community-based open access book and journal publishers in France because of this availability of funding. You have a very strong national library consortia, Couperin, but traditionally they've not really been um, targeting their uh, expenditure with publishers to drive a transition to open access. They're interested in supporting uh, self-archiving rights, again, to get content flowing into this infrastructure, but they haven't been um, uh, so strong uh, in entering into transformative agreements to procure publishing services for gold open access publishing. And France, un unsurprisingly, has a close alignment with European policies, its science ministry explicitly supports a move to open access. It supports European Commission and other uh, policies in this respect. And one of the uh, large national funders, ANR, is a member of Coalition S. Um, but, but others are not. So there's a mixed picture there. Okay, if we uh, stick on this slide, but move on to Germany, it's a little bit different helps if I don't block my camera. So in uh, Germany, there's a very strong regional presence, the Lander. Um, there are strong libraries and consortia there. And actually, they've been experimenting with how to secure more open access through their library practices uh, for a very long time. Um, it, it's really in Germany at this more local level that the idea of transformative agreements, that libraries would procure not only reading access, but publishing service as well has bubbled up. There's broad support for open access at this regional level and their money is aligned to where their mouths or their policies are. There are many repositories too, so you get all flavors of OA, but there's a real push to, to get more uh, gold open access publishing underway. Research authors all have the right to self-archive after 12 months of publication, and this is embedded into the copyright framework in Germany. At national level, it's also very visible. There's a strong pro-OA OA, uh, policy direction. Funders such as DFG have long championed open access and supported OA publishing costs, and also have funded libraries and universities uh, to experiment with different flavors of open. And the big four research organizations, Max Planck, Leibniz, Fraunhofer, and Helmholtz have also got a, a strong pro-OA bent in their activities. Project DEAL has come to um, uh, quite widespread attention in uh, the last few years. 
It's really the first attempt in Germany to form a national um, procurement uh, consortium um, to negotiate with publishers. It's driven by the university rectors as well as libraries, and they've taken a, a super tough stance with the largest publishers for uh, transformative agreements um, in the publish and read flavor. Internationally, again, unsurprisingly for Germany, at the heart of the European project, there's close alignment and support for European OA policies, for the European Commission approaches. But German funders aren't in coalition S, and that should not be misinterpreted as any lack of support for its principles. It, it's about a lack of comfort mandating what researchers do in such a kind of bold way. Um, but the alignment and spirit is definitely there. And then finally, the UK, strong support for open access, uh, both from national funders like UKRI, but also from private foundations like the Wellcome Trust and other um, medical um, foundations and trusts. Strong support from libraries as well, but possibly less coupled with their practical and procurement efforts than has been traditional in Germany for the last for a few years, and um, there's support from government, but this is um, pro-OA, but balanced with an eye toward the very strong economic contributions made by the UK's vibrant publishing industries. Um, and what to say about the UK and Europe? Well, we are, uh, despite Brexit, still closely uh, aligned. There are strong ties, again, culture um, and approach, and these are especially true in the research community. So on open access approaches, open science, I would expect to see a continuing uh, close alignment and link. We move on to the next slide, Howard. Um, at European level, there are significant funding streams from the Euro European Commission and its um, um, funding initiatives that require open access from its grant recipients. And interestingly, organizations representing stakeholders at European level are also very clear and explicit about their support for OA. So I've taken some screenshots here. On the left with the yellow bar, Eurodoc, which is an organization representing early career researchers, right at the top of their homepage, they're looking to offer open science ambassador training. Um, Lieber in the center, right across the top of their activities, innovation in scholarly communication, front and center. Lower left, LIRU, which is the League of European Rectors, uh, our research university, sorry. Um, again, if you look at the very first paragraph of their activities, you will see open science very, very explicitly. Um, there is a strong support for Europe's move to embrace open access and open science from these stakeholders. From the ERC as well, these are, um, uh, this is a, an important funder for uh, very uh, elite researchers in Europe. Um, very positive about open access, having a little wobble at the minute about uh, Plan S and Coalition S for reasons I'll come on to. We move on to the next slide, Howard. Coalition S is uh, a coalition of funders. It acts at supranational level. Most of these are European based, but there are international bodies as well. And the secretariat, the support um, for it comes from uh, the commission and also primarily from Science Europe as well as its members. Coalition S has put forward Plan S, um, which is uh, quite frankly, just highly innovative. It's highly um, pro open access. It's committed to pushing the boundaries on what's comfortable for everyone, all stakeholders, um, not only ERC. And it is, um, from some perspectives, operating at a dizzying speed. But whatever you think of it, it is driving innovation. It is increasing the amount of engagement and um, the pace of the movement toward open access. And it comes up with um, activities, left, right, and center, just four that have been announced in recent um, uh, months, weeks, or days include um, a new rights retention policy. So all of their grant recipients will need to keep their copyright so that they can share and ensure immediate open access to their articles. There are new requirements for publishers um, to uh, make transparent 
various uh, metrics about their journals along with um, a more granular breakdown of price information. There's a big push here on um, diamond open access. So again, scholar, often scholar-led uh, publications uh, hosted on an open infrastructure, funded in ways other than APCs or subscriptions. And there's a really big push from Plan S on transformative agreements, expecting um, publishers to have any hybrid journals as part of a transformative agreement or on a transformative path in order to continue getting um, funding from Coalition S members from next year. So the months are ticking away. But I wanted to emphasize here that the impact of Plan S is not only in terms of the uh, number of researchers that receive direct grants from them and the APCs that they might pay for, it's having catapulted this concept of transformative agreements into the international stratosphere, as it were, um, and really bringing a spotlight on this. And at the minute, um, we're tracking transformative agreements quite closely, and those look to me set to drive more change in the growth of open access than the direct publishing decisions of Plan S grant recipients themselves. So it's one for publishers really to watch um, if you haven't already begun to do so. Um, Howard, the next slide, we're almost done. Transformative agreements were not invented by Plan S. Plan S is pretty good. Uh, the Coalition S members are pretty good about plucking good ideas wherever they find them. And transformative agreements have really come from Germany, as I mentioned earlier, from the local and regional level. Max Planck has been a leading champion. And Max Planck is behind the OA 2020 initiative, which is now running, for example, some really high quality online training seminars for librarians around the world about how to negotiate transformative agreements with publishers. Just to get the point across really clearly, the impact of Plan S is not only in what its grant recipients do, where they put their money directly, it's in driving changes in university and library procurement activities. We go to the next to last slide here. Um, I was asked to emphasize two things that publishers need to do now. So the first off, if you're not looking at Plan S, please take that serious, seriously. It has a broader impact than is um, evident at first glance. And they do come up with so many ideas, it can be hard to track it. But um, I, I've mentioned a few of them here. And the second thing is do keep an eye on what librarians are doing and thinking about procuring OA services from you. It is unlikely that some discounts on APCs here or some offsetting there is going to be sufficient to meet um, uh, changing procurement practices and demands in the library community. This is obviously um, uh, different in different parts of the world, but if we can move to the last slide, Howard, I've got a little map um, and the darker the colors of the country, the more active this push is. You can see this is increasing globally. It's not limited to the northern hemisphere. Um, I'm in fact involved in a project to look at transformative agreements in, in use in more than 20 um, least developed countries. It has broad applicability, something for publishers to be thinking about. So I'll end there. Thanks very much. And my contact details are there if anybody would like to uh, drop me a line or stay in contact. Thanks, Howard. All right, thank you, Alicia. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Yasushi now. Um, your slides are up, so take it away. Hello, uh, my name is Yasushi Okasaku from uh, uh, Japan Science and Technology Agency. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, forum organizers for inviting me to this wonderful event. Um, would you please interrupt me if you don't hear me uh, from now on? So, uh, next slide, please. Just a little bit about my agency. The JST is one of the funding agencies in Japan, uh, but its main business is funding, but also do some other businesses, including especially information services such as the Jana platform or other databases. So that might be a reason that the JST is a little bit more active about promoting open science than other funding agencies. So I believe that's the reason why I'm here to introducing a policy status in Japan. Next slide, please. So uh, my mission uh, here today is to illustrate 
the open science policy landscape in Japan. So I would try to show you a chronological overview of the various activities regarding open science policy at various policy uh, bodies. But unfortunately, those open science policies are mostly about data and uh, very little about open access. So I will add some other contents about open access in the later half of my presentation. And also I will show you about some activities on JSD. Next slide, please. So about open science. Next slide, please. Um, if I were to talk anything about the science and technology policy or administration, uh, administration in Japan, I had to explain how the science and technology administration has been carried out in Japan. There is a master plan called Science and Technology Basic Plan, which is renewed every five years. And we follow this plan for science and technology administration. We are in the first phase, uh, starting in 2016 and ending actually this year. So if I were to explain about open science policy, it is important to understand how the open science is written in this plan. Next slide, please. So this slide shows an event carried out by many policy uh, bodies in Japan in the chronological order. The events written in the black letters or starting from the left-hand side is those from the government. And red is those from the cabinet office and blues are other entities such as ministries or agencies and councils. So back in 2011, which is the start of the previous science and technology basic plan period, there were only a brief mention about the promotion of open access. In contrast, the current uh, basic plan started 2016. Uh, it states the government will, uh, will uh, promote the open science in Japan. So the change was actually uh, uh, initiated by the discussion paper issued in 2015 by the expert group set at the cabinet office. I want you to remember this expert group because this expert group has been a driving force of the open science policy in Japan. So anyway, this discussion paper illustrated how Japan will promote open science in a comprehensive way. So this document affected the Science and Technology Basic Plan issued in 2016. Then how the open science was mentioned in this basic plan. Next slide, please. Well, uh, because this is at highest level of the document, naturally the uh, discussion is vague, but there are three points uh, shown in the uh, bottom half of the slide. It says that Japan will establish a system for promotion of open science. That's good. And uh, secondly, the Jap uh, uh, Japan recognizes that the promotion of open science is important to expand the utilization of the outcomes of publicly funded research. Uh, it's agreeable. However, they did not forget to mention the third point, uh, uh, saying that the exemptions or restrictions should be made for some kind of data that needs uh, careful treatment. So anyway, this description illustrates how the, the government officials uh, considered about open science at that time. The next slide, please. So this uh, basic plan uh, initiated very many uh, policy activities in Japan. In 2017, this was a very remarkable year. Uh, when the every funding agency started to establish the open science policy one after another, as shown in the right bottom part of the slide, uh, namely JST, JSPS, AMET, these are the major funding agencies in Japan, and METI is actually a ministry uh, for education, trade, and industry. But if you cover all these four bodies, this is almost everything about funding in Japan. Uh, only JST had a comprehensive study uh, policy about open science and other agencies had a kind of uh, partial plan, but anyway, they started to have a policy. And also this year, the expert group was reestablished for the third time to uh, establish a more detailed strategic plan to implement the open science policy written in the basic plan. 
And that was reflected to the document called Integrated Innovation Strategy 2018. This is actually a strategic document. Uh, I'm sorry, I, would you go back to the previous slide, please? Yes, the Integrated Innovation Strategy is a document that we need every year to illustrate what should be done in more detail based on the science and technology basic plan. And also the expert group started to uh, produce many documents or recommendations one after another since then. So next slide, please. So what's written in this Integrated Innovation Strategy 2018? There are three major points. First of all, the document says that the Japan will establish the national data infrastructure and start operating it in 2020, just this year. So people are working hard to start the operation of this infrastructure. The second part is about data management policy and institutions. There are 24 national research institutes in Japan, and the document says that they will establish data management policy by, again, 2020. And at this point, half of the institutes have established the policy in some form. So the, the remaining half is working very hard, I believe. And third point is about funding agencies. There are 14 funding bodies in Japan, uh, including ministries and agencies. The document says that they will establish the data management policy by 2021. Uh, and so far, about half of the funding bodies have, have uh, finished their homework, including JSD. So this is the current action plans for the policy uh, bodies in Japan, and they're working hard for that to meet this requirement. The next thing I should mention is that the, uh, yes, next slide, please. Around this period, there was a commitment from the community uh, studying. Uh, the, the slide explains about the uh, uh, community called Research Data Utilization Forum. This forum was established in 2016. This is meant as a community for stakeholders related to the utilization of research data, and it increased number of members steadily. One of the major activity of this forum is the, called subcommittees, and actually the, these uh, subcommittees are pretty much the same as the working groups or interest groups of the Research Data Alliance. The table shows the list of the subcommittees so far established, so they are uh, going to uh, they have uh, um, discussed various topics and uh, published uh, some uh, recommendations or reports. Next slide, please. And also, start, uh, the community started to have an annual conference about open science called Japan Open Science Summit starting 2018. And last year's conference gathered uh, 560 participants, and it was very great success. Unfortunately, this year's event was canceled, but we plan to have another event next year. The next slide, please. So going back to this timeline, uh, we have come down to 2018. So in the right-hand side of this slide, I put at another timeline from the commitment from the community. Now, around 2019, the outputs from this RDUS committee uh, started to come out, and one of those documents are uh, uh, merged into the uh, report from the expert group. So this is the beginning of the engagement from community to the policy making arena. So I think the ecosystem is working uh, reasonably nicely. So we are now into uh, 2020. We are waiting for another integrated innovation strategy to come out very soon. And the expert group is, uh, is going to publish another report very soon. And we are waiting for the new basic plan starting uh, next April. So we'll see what happens in the next phase of the uh, open science policy move in Japan. Next slide, please. So you may have noticed that there are very little discussion about open access, unfortunately, in Japan. Uh, so I will follow up this part in the rem uh, remaining uh, slides. Next slide, please. Uh, so far, the universities and institutions have implemented open access policies uh, one after another. And also the major funding agencies have open access policies in some form. JST has uh, mandated the open access to funded articles. 
JSPS and AMED uh, has a policy of a recommendation. Uh, and unfortunately, the policy discussion about open access was not very active so far. Next slide, please. However, uh, this year, the Ministry of Education established as, uh, a committee called a Journal Subcommittee. Uh, this subcommittee was established to discuss about various issues about academic journals. So that includes uh, the short-term issues, uh, the issues about subscription cost or APC support, and as a mid-term issues, they will discuss about open access as a whole, and also about the publication of research output from the publicly funded researches. And the, the agenda includes also about the evaluation of research researchers, not relying solely, uh, not relying solely on the article count. This is a very important topic, uh, not only in Japan, but also globally. So we, will, we expect that new policy will come out later this year or maybe early next year. So that's something we should be looking at. Next slide, please. Finally, I will conclude my presentation by introducing the activity in JST. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the JST established open, open science policy back in 2017. And there are three pillars. One is open access, it's mandate now. Data management policy is also mandate now. The data publication is recommended for evidence data. So we have a policy, but next thing we, we need is the mechanism to monitor the compliance. For that purpose, we utilize the Chorus dashboard. Next slide, please. So JST is using the Chorus dashboard officially from 2017. The purpose is to, of course, to promote open access, but uh, secondly, to establish a mechanism to monitor the publication status and also open access status of JST funded articles. Next slide, please. Uh, using the data taken from the Chorus dashboard, we can we are able to know uh, many things. Uh, of course, it's still under, uh, 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 under study. For example, this slide shows a number of the articles uh, funded by JSD and also the open access articles as a function of publication year. There are lots of things that we can learn from this uh, figure, but these are the information we can get from the course dashboard. The next slide, please. And also, this is a, a uh, articles marked as open access by course mechanism as a function of publication year, uh, and with its a classification of a type of the article, version of record or so author manuscript. So these information should help us to further pursue the open access to the funded articles. Next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, Today, I illustrated the open science landscape in Japan. It's done based on the science and technology basic plan. And I think we are uh, 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 proceeding steadily. And about open access, uh, the universities, research institutes are, uh, are establishing open access policy. And also, JST works with CORUS to develop oil compliance measurement. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, uh, Yasushi, and thanks to all of our speakers. Um, not sure how we are on time. Um, we have some questions in the Q&A, and if we don't get to them, I would encourage each of our speakers to go take a look there, and you can type in answers to any questions there that we don't get to. Um, Tara, are you going to uh, do the questions, or? Um, I can, or you can, or you can read through them yourself. Um, uh, for your um, I'm happy to do. I, I want to, you know. I'll always take the moderator's uh, uh, privilege and ask a first question of there are a lot of policies here and we know that each um, each paper we publish usually has more than one author, often more than one funding source. They're often more than one institution and, and, and uh, more than one country very often as well. Um, so there's a lot that a researcher has to figure out as far as staying compliant and, and you know, we, we we don't want them spending all their time sort of jumping through bureaucratic hoops. So um, what is being done and what can be done to reduce um, uh, the, the burden that's being put on the researcher here? Um, thoughts? 
So one of the things that is happening, um, again, an initiative of Coalition S under the Plan S umbrella, is um, investment in a creation called the Journal Finder Tool. Um, that is to uh, provide a free service that will help researchers understand which journals um, are uh, compliant with, with its sets of policies. Um, there aren't equivalent tools in other parts of the world. Um, so this is a huge challenge. You're right to bring it up, David. And that's where you know, more harmony between different funder approaches or more investment in this sort of infrastructure to support researchers and universities could be really powerful. I think CORUS has an, a, a potentially very powerful role to play here as well. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. You know, Plan S does, is working on a tool and, you know, it's a, it's a big challenge just to do a Plan S tool, um, but then you, everybody's going to have funding and, and collaborators elsewhere. So it, it, it is a, an interesting um, uh, problem that, that's going to arise. Um, Alicia, while, while I've got you talking, uh, there are a couple questions in about the ERC recently leaving uh, Plan S. Uh, any thoughts on that? And um, you know, Plan S was first announced and expected to see a large amount of growth, and I'm not sure that has gone, uh, you know, as, as they had hoped. So uh, where do you see that impacting Plan S and um, any, you know, broader long-term picture of uh, expansion, or is this going to be a localized thing and other people pick up bits and pieces of it? I thank you for this. So the um, ERC pulling out of Coalition S um, has attracted some public comment on Twitter and so forth. And I, I've seen two broad um, interpretations. One, oh, the wheels are coming off Plan S. And the other, oh my gosh, ERC, they're such dinosaurs, they don't get it. They don't get that OA is the future. From where I'm sitting, neither of those is really uh, quite right or fair. I think ERC um, uh, does support open access. They support evolution rather than revolution in how they achieve that. And they're very mindful not to in any way be seen to or perceived as curtailing um, the choices that researchers want to make about where and how to publish. Um, they also don't have that direct influence in the way that national funders do on procurement practices around transformative agreements, uh, for example. So it actually makes rational sense from where they're sitting and, and uh, as part of this broader landscape, to me at least. Others may have different views. In terms of growth, um, th there's, there's a lag time between Plan S and when it really starts to bite. And, and really that time when it begins to bite is going to start becoming um, evident um, at the start of next year when, when some of the requirements um, snap into place and where there could be changes in the way money is spent. Um, so I think it's a little bit too soon to, to judge it harshly um, at this point. Um, a question came up from uh, Dan from your talk. Um, you stated there was a correlation between wealthier nations and open access policies and, and someone has asked sort of and maybe the whole panel can, can expand a little bit on that of, you know, why is that? And, um, you know, are there any implications there as well? It's a really good question. So I'm going to welcome other panel's thoughts on that. Um, my gut is it's, it may be something to do with how well established in, if you like, the publishing ecosystem those countries are. So, for example, if you look at a country such as China, it's worked very, very hard to sort of come up to speed and, and get its output established in in general the more western focused journals and i just wonder if there's a dynamic around that where the wealthier nations so typically north america north and western europe are more established and therefore they have the luxury of being able to if, if you will start to, to play around with policies but i would very much welcome the other panelists view on that uh, i think it's a, it's a good and open question Any further thoughts or <laughs> don't want to touch that one, that's fine. Um, no, it seems sensible. I would just add Japan's one of those research intensive wealthy countries as well and has been, um, you know, a leader in this area too. So actually, so, so uh, turning to Japan, um, Yasushi, there's a question in, um, do you think the next science plan will continue the emphasis on open data 
Well, uh, and, you know, is it likely that there will be any increased emphasis on open access to published papers, or is it too early to speculate on that? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, about data, I, I believe that the next plan will uh, further strengthen the languages. Uh, I'm not sure how much, but uh, that's the way to go. On the other hand, the, about open access, the discussion in Japan about open access is tightly connected to the journal substitution issues. Well, I'm not so sure that is fortunate or unfortunate, but that's the way they are discussed, so which is not very simple. So I am a little bit pessimistic about the promotion of open access in Japan, unfortunately. But we'll see in, in a couple of months, yes. Um, there's a question about uh, preprints. Um, the question is, you know, uh, uh, preprint services versus repositories in, in a lot of contexts, but I, I'd like to ask the bigger question about preprints. Where do preprints fit into the global uh, open access uh, 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 ecosystem? Um, is this a viable way to, to drive open access? Um, how are policymakers thinking about preprints? Um, I'll, I'll kick, off, kick off first. Um, so um, I think, yes, they're part of it. It's interesting to know that generally, so if you look at something like Plan S, there are two routes to compliance, one of which publish the thing in a journal, um, typically known as gold open access, although we spend the next three hours talking about definitions. But the other one is the so-called repository route, where you make a version of the paper available via a preprint. And I think the key thing is to what degree is the peer review process considered important by the funder or the policymaker, Because to my mind, that's essentially the difference between those two routes of compliance, whether or not you want the involvement of a journal in the peer review process or not. Um, and then of course, depending on your view on that, then becomes a big question because how viable is science without some sort of peer review process? And I'm sure we're all very well aware of that rush to get preprints out, say around COVID-19. And then of course, the issues of quality and reliability of findings that follow from that. Um, so I think it's a fast evolving situation and Alicia, welcome your thoughts on it. You've, I know you've been closer to this in, ma in many regards than, than I have. So I agree that preprints are here to stay, especially in STEM subjects where there's a huge pressure to accelerate the speed of science. COVID's a great example. Um, but we're seeing experimentation now with uh, post dissemination peer review, post-publication peer review. So there are, I think, going to be some hybrid models. It's not just about getting your preprint out in public. It's about the subsequent development and quality assurance of that and, and how these different versions continue to thrive in the ecosystem and how publishers choose what they're going to publish in their journals and showcase. It may be, it already is, in fact, that preprints are um, a useful editorial hunting ground, actually, for innovative trends and content and David you're, you're more expert in that area than I am. I mean you could almost control I mean, this is a very theoretical kind of you know future gazing model but you could almost gaze of an ecosystem where if everything is put into some sort of repository as a preprint by default and you then take the hunting ground concept one stage further and publishers will then actively need to compete for authorship based on preprints and that is you know one way of conceiving a future. How realistic that is, I don't know, but it's, it's an interesting thought experiment to play with. Uh, if I may, uh, from funders' perspective, um, it's difficult how to uh, recognize the articles in the preprint service. As a funder, if we evaluate the research output, if it's a journal, we know that there is a, you know, uh, a history of, I should say, there's a long history uh, that the journals have come to uh, today's uh, 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 you know, uh, position. So we can have a trust to some extent to the articles appear in peer, uh, peer uh, reviewed journals. On the contrary, you're not very certain uh, about the quality of the articles in preprint. And especially that depends on how the fellow researchers recognize the quality of the preprints. And we all know that all that may depend on the uh, 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 research area. So from funders' perspective, we are not very sure how to handle or recognize those uh, uh, preprint service as an out, as an outlet of the research output. So. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to try and squeeze in one more uh, question, but um, Alicia and Dan in particular, there's some specific questions in the Q&A about like data points on some of your slides. Maybe you can jump in and answer those. Um, there's a question um, on 
uh, transformative agreements. And um, the question is, you know, I think that the idea is, you know, Plan S has certainly galvanized a lot of growth in uh, 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 transformative agreements. We've seen a real um, expansion of those. And I think the question is, is how much of those can be attributed to, um, to Plan S and countries outside of Plan S worried about collaborating with Plan S uh, researchers? And how much of this is just really much more of a global uh, desire for these um, for these types of deals, regardless of, of you know of Plan S. Um, uh, uh, thoughts on what's really driving transformative agreements, both within and outside of uh, coalition S countries. So transformative agreements first arose in Germany, and uh, colleagues at Max Planck um, and some of the strong regional consortia. Um, uh, I, I, as far as I know, are the, the people that originated this vision and did the first um, agreements with various publishers. I think what Plan S has done is has made that approach, that uh, possible path uh, to transition much more um, widely discussed and known. Um, and it's also funded, in some cases, practical experimentation from consortia uh, with that model. So, for example, we did a, a Coalition S funded project last year with uh, consortia in four countries and a variety of society publishers um, to experiment for the first time uh, with that model. I wonder also if it shows the way a bit, you know, if, if you are a buyer of content, a librarian or a consortium in another territory, you see what's happening in Europe, you see that some of these deals are actually workable, that may then cause you to revisit some of your long held assumptions, you may, you know, find you, you get the courage to go ahead and do it. And then I, I think one other subtlety that and I think this is going to come out of COVID-19, these deals rely on a cooperation between two traditionally separate aspects of university life, the librarian on one side, the faculty on the other. And quite often librarians hands are tied, their funding is set centrally, um, they may be forced, let's say, to renew subscription deals under pressure from faculty. But with COVID-19, we've seen a real cooperation between the two sides. Librarians have come to the forefront in helping institutions make this great online pivot. And therefore, we may see closer cooperation between those two stakeholder groups in universities. And that's actually quite key to driving these deals. So the more the, the, the deals are uh, uh, um, agreed collectively the better. If you think, think of something like California Digital Library, you've very much got faculty on board um, in helping make the changes necessary to these combined agreements. So um, I think Plan S can, can be a sort of an indirect enabler in, in that sense, as well as just a, a sort of a, a direct local um, spur to change. No, I think it's, it, it'll be interesting also seeing the impact of COVID in terms of Library budgets, um, you know, university budgets are going to be down across the board. Libraries are going to take a big hit. Um, it's unclear how research budgets are going to be affected. You know, yeah. hopefully this will spur more research, but you know, economies are are struggling, so it's not clear um, how that's going to work and and whether that is going to slow this sort of uh, progress that we've been seeing in these types of uh, cooperative deals. Um, so I think we need to wrap up as we're out of time. But thank you again to all of the speakers, and please do hop in and, and type in some answers to people's questions as well. And uh, I'll turn things back over. Um, Alex, I don't know if you're, you're up next or, uh, or who will introduce uh, it's, it's me, thank you very much. All right, over to you then. All right, thanks uh, to all the session one speakers. So welcome to session two. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Sarah Nusser, the professor of statistics at Iowa State University and a core member of the AAU APLU Accelerating Public Access to Research Data Project Team. Welcome, Sarah. I met Sarah during several data set oriented conferences in 2019. She was always one of the main voices in those events. Um, so I knew we had to have her for today's event. Uh, she is one of the most active and savvy research officers wor working towards public access to research data. So Sarah is gonna tell us about the challenges and progress for academia in accelerating public access to research data. So over to you, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, Howard. Um, what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about the U.S. academic context and why public access to research data is important to scholarship, uh, as well as something about the actions that are being taken to accelerate its implementation in academia. And I want to emphasize something that David referred to earlier. Uh, our ability to transition to public access to research data 
really rests on the primary actors in this drama, the researchers uh, who produce the data and are, the, are primarily seated at academic uh, research institutions. And as part of the ecosystem that surrounds researchers, we need to think about ways to make it easier for them to plan, document, and prepare data for sharing. Um, they need stronger incentives and rewards uh, for the work that's required to um, share data. And institutions need the cost and the burden of helping researchers to be minimized to the degree possible. Next slide, please. And I want to note that uh, researchers and institutions across the U.S. Are, have already been dealing with a lot of different kinds of changes, moving much more to team-based scholarship, to highly interdisciplinary teams that focus on convergent uh, views of uh, uh, phenomena during research, new ways of practicing research through open science, uh, which was referred to earlier, um, and more transparency in conducting research, an increased focus on rigor in research, and more recently in the U.S., a heightened emphasis on managing science and security. So this tension between openness and, uh, and protection. Next slide, please. So it's perhaps understandable that the reactions to the OSTP memo uh, a few years back were not uniformly positive. And for some researchers, um, uh, uh, providing public access to research data is second nature. For others, it's entirely foreign. And for those who have not been doing it, have been highly successful, their motivations are not clear to them. Um, so there, there has been a fair amount of complaint about the extra work, the compliance burden, and so on, on the researcher side um, that is mirrored to some extent on the uh, administrator side. One of the things that institutions face is that we're not implementing uh, public access to research data for a discipline. We're doing it for all disciplines, not only scientific dif disciplines, but the humanities and so on. And so that's a huge challenge. This is an, essentially a completely different kind of compliance challenge that we, than what we've had before. Um, lots of different varieties in how the requirement is expressed. But I think that the focus on compliance is really ill-placed. Next slide, please. And as yes, Sushi Ogasaka was uh, talking about, I think data sharing really needs to be viewed in the larger uh, context of moving towards open science. And there's a great report that obviously uh, helped frame what's going on in the EU by the Royal Society that was issued in 2012 that really uh, discusses this in a uh, really uh, helpful way. We are really undergoing a shift in how we execute the scientific method uh, because of uh, uh, functions that are enabled by the internet. So it's much easier to collaborate, share data, and other kinds of systems during research. It's possible to produce and share a richer suite of project products um, about the goals and the process and underlying evidence for research. And so, uh, so this is uh, what David referred to as part of the evolution of how we practice research, but um, the fundamentals of scientific inquiry have not changed. We're still engaging in the open pursuit of uh, an exchange of ideas. We're still sharing and scrutinizing findings in ways that are fundamental to de uh, demonstrating the rigor of the work and earning our, the public trust. But our, our challenge is that it does profoundly affect uh, research practice in any field. Next slide. Fortunately, uh, there's a huge payoff um, if we can pull off this evolution to a highly functional state. Uh, we can count on more rapid release of findings and the associated documentation to accelerate knowledge dissemination, but also its application to new settings. Uh, the focus on transparency of the research process and the product really helps promote rigor um, and the quality of information that's released, as well as the capacity for another reader or user uh, to evaluate uh, the fitness for use of the data, um, either for a question being considered or for a future use. Uh, in addition, there's the potential for increased ROI 
um, for researchers in a properly credited and rewarded system uh, for their impact and contribution, as well as institutions, more bang per buck for the sponsors and the benefit of having discoveries arise sooner in the process. So next slide, please. The problem is that this is really, really complicated. You're already hearing from a lot of different kinds of stakeholders who have different ideas about visions for the future. Um, and we all have incomplete knowledge of the, the full perspectives of all of the actors in this system. And data sharing practice is, is really quite immature relative to publication for most fields. Um, and it's highly variable in how it gets manifested across disciplines. Um, we're also facing a lot of heterogeneity, as I mentioned earlier, in the funder requirements. And it's essentially about changing the culture of how we reward research and how we conduct research. And so we all need to, to work as a community to collectively move this forward. Uh, next slide, please. So we're really fortunate that our, in the US, our uh, two associations that are really advocates for academia in a lot of different ways, the Association of American Universities and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities banded together to help foster change in academia around this. And we're also very fortunate that the NSF has provided two, two grants to help fund the convenings and work of this group. Um, and uh, more recently, NIH has uh, also contributed to the, the work that's being done. Next slide. Um, so I want to talk about three different phases of this work. Uh, back in 2017, uh, these two organizations convened a working group called the Public Access Working Group, who uh, uh, met with stakeholders and agencies about uh, the uh, Holdren memo and how, how, what we need to do in terms of developing shared goals and uh, what we could do uh, as institutions as well as agencies. And uh, it, it was fairly uh, easy to come up with shared goals of minimizing burden uh, for all of the actors in this, um, in, the, in the initiative, um, imp the importance of prioritizing data quality and the ability to evaluate data uh, once it is published, and the importance of really considering the benefits of sharing data in relation to the cost of creating access and preserving the data after the fact. Um, there were, we also uh, provided considerations for sponsors. Um, the two most important in my mind were just the call for harmonization wherever possible, at least some core policies and approaches, as well as uh, clearer guidance on compliance requirements, monitoring and enforcement, which has been evolving since uh, this report. Um, the, there were recommendations for both for institutions individually, but also as, uh, uh, as a collective to move this forward. And that led to the second phase, next slide, um, that focused on really galvanizing the implementation in academia. And through an NSF uh, grant, uh, the AAU and APLU uh, developed uh, a, a workshop convening that was focused on bringing teams of uh, representatives from universities. So a typical team might have somebody from the research office, from the library, from the information technology organization, uh, policy related, as well as faculty representatives. And uh, these teams were exposed to information on the landscape from agencies and other, and other universities. Um, and time was provided to them to convene uh, or to, to visit and develop a plan for implementation for their institution, uh, as well as to meet with your functional uh, equivalents across institutions. Um, and so next slide, please. Um, uh, we, uh, that was an, uh, just an incredibly rich workshop that led to a lot of work being done by the 30 institutions that were able uh, to attend. I should say that we got many more applicants than we had space to take in. Um, a year later, we found that the, uh, the teams had gone back and established formal campus working groups that were engaged in implementation and outreach. Um, they had also uh, developed or were in the process of developing policies around research data, and were creating and expanding existing campus services to support researchers. 
but a lot of challenges remained um, in relation to researchers, just a continued aversion to sharing data and a lack of awareness around the services that were available to them, and uh, still uh, a lack of clarity around the value proposition incentives uh, for sharing data. For administrators, um, uh, it became clear that we needed more role clarity, a single lead perhaps of the initiative, elevated priority for messaging the importance of sharing data and open science more broadly, and just uh, issues with resources, which as uh, David noted, has really become much more constrained under uh, the pandemic. Next slide, please. So we're in the middle of phase three, or phase three, the third initiative. Um, uh, a second grant was issued by NSF um, and NIH contributed to this grant. And the goal here was to extend the work of um, the initial set of 30 institutions to reach more campuses and to provide a practical guide for more widespread implementation of public access to research data. Um, the uh, third area was really to think uh, longer term. This is really a long game that we're all engaged in uh, and come up with a strategy for advocation and advocacy and facilitation. Um, so this grant was really focused on a series of convenings and developing a, a guide as well as a strategy. Next slide, please. Um, and the initial convening took place, thank goodness, uh, before the pandemic really hit the US. Um, and it involved discussing areas that we needed to develop for an implementation guide with 30 teams uh, through a, a conference the day before a summit that added 45 new institutions. Um, and we're in the process right now of drafting that guide um, with uh, a focus on areas that have represented challenges for institutions. Um, including the value proposition for public access, how, we, how you really coordinate implementation on campus, kind of infrastructure and tools that would be beneficial, focusing on culture, culture change and operationalizing that change. Um, so um, I guess I would say stay tuned because this, uh, this work we hope to wrap up over the next year or so. Next slide. So let me offer just a few uh, observations uh, for academia. Um, for me, I think the, the linchpin for us is really to accelerate uh, uh, the change in research practice. Um, it, it takes longer to prepare, plan, and uh, document data for sharing. Um, and uh, it's, it's important that we make it a lot easier for researchers to do that. this. And uh, we're very fortunate that tools are beginning to emerge for various aspects of the research process that would help us develop documentation through the process. Um, an area that's not getting a lot of discussion yet, but that we really need to begin focusing on is this balance between openness and protection. Researchers in general are not all that knowledgeable about where we need to protect sensitive data uh, whether that's privacy and confidentiality, proprietary information, um, or national security. And uh, we need a, a deeper discussion on this. There's actually a lot of methods for sharing data and protecting it, and uh, this is not very well understood by our research community. Uh, for ecosystem stakeholders, it's really important for universities to, to continue elevating the priority of open science approaches as well as the cultural changes that are needed in the recognition system. Um, and I would say that's true also of funders of, and publishers. We really need to um, go beyond requiring data sharing and really recognizing the value of this and how we reward and, and um, uh, give credit to researchers in sharing data. Um, it's also important uh, to harmonize policies and approaches, especially since we're dealing with uh, essentially all disciplines uh, all funders, and the more we can come up with core approaches, uh, the easier it is for both researchers and institutions. And finally, I would say that events like uh, this event that CHORUS has organized are really important to helping us all understand each other's perspectives and integrate them so we can make progress together going forward. Um, thank you very much. So Sarah, that's great. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? There are none in the Q&A at this point. 
All right, well, I'll take the moderator privilege and ask Sarah some questions, if you don't mind, Sarah. Um, so you mentioned that citation is important. So do you think it's important that journals cite uh, related data sets in their references? You've got a lot of publishers in the audience here. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it's important to remember that um, the way academic researchers are rewarded is through measures of contribution, quality, and impact. And citation is very key to that, uh, uh, both in attaching a researcher to that research product, but also in the downstream impact and how that uh, those um, data are cited. Um, and so this is really beneficial for the researcher. I would say institutions are also very interested uh, in, in uh, having the collective credit for the researchers attributed to the institutions. And so uh, really making sure that it's part of the review process that you uh, 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 support open sharing of research data where appropriate um, and uh, ask others to cite data uh, and publications, all of that is really important. So s staying on that citing uh, theme for a second, um, metadata, so things like data cite and Crossref, uh, do you think it's important that the data set creators themselves cite their affiliation in their metadata? Yes, um, it's really interesting because researchers are, um, I would characterize them as cats. Um, they are <laughs> really uh, focus on the contributions they're making, their research team and so on. And it's also possible for them to have accounts in various uh, repositories and so on that are not affiliated with research institution. And to the extent we can network these, um, it's very beneficial for, uh, for them to receive credit and for the institution to receive credit and just make sure that the elements of the support system for, um, for how the data were uh, created are represented, and that includes funders as well. So it looks like we did get a question in. So it says here that harmonization is a laudable aim, but data covers a vast amount of material, and as you've noted, the whole research spectrum. How can we work towards, I guess, towards fair principles when looking as field notes versus questionnaire responses versus Excel data files, et cetera? Are we ever really going to be able to create standard structures that cover the gamut of content? And, a, and the person's apologizing for their garbled nature of questions, but I think it's a great question. Yes, yes. And um, I note that this is really focused uh, more on the types of pro products. And I, this, is, um, this is one of the longer hauls we're going to have to engage in because the, uh, the disciplines are really important in, in articulating what's of value. Uh, to share. And uh, I would be most pleased with the process uh, that funders use um, in order to think about uh, requirements for sharing data. For example, there's been uh, harmonization of aspects of the data management plan. So things that are around policies and procedures about the process to create data that can be harmonized through some core set of elements, I think would be really helpful um, so that researchers and institutions don't have to know what the rules are for every single uh, sponsor in the process. Um, I also think that uh, one of the things that that 2017 report uh, discussed was we really need to focus at this point um, on the data that supports a publication. I don't think that's the end game here, but uh, that narrows the scope of what you need to think about in terms of research products. Um, and uh, various disciplines have uh, other more raw information that is uh, standard for them to be able to share and they have standards around that sharing process. Um, and I think that the, the, the whole notion of focusing on fair, some of that, well, actually a great deal of it has to do with how you set up the underlying information infrastructure so that you can achieve findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. But we also have to think about what information we need to have attached to a data set to truly make it reusable. So it's more in my mind than just sharing a, an Excel file and metadata about the columns, but you really need to understand the, the, the goal of the study and the specific questions that might have been used or methodologies that were used for the measurements to understand its applicability for reuse. 
So you got two more questions here. I'm going to try to squeeze them both in here. You have one from Nick Campbell. So incentives for data sharing are one thing. What researchers care most about answering questions and getting credit for that? So they'll tend to prioritize getting their paper out ahead of their data. I think you actually said that, right? Do we need uh, more embedded data specialists for whom data is the, the thing that floats their boat? Um, I think we need more embedded data specialists to, as part of the burden reduction strategy. Um, it's, uh, I'm a statistician, and so I understand a little bit about how difficult it is to collect quality information, document it, and share it. And it's, um, we already asked researchers to have a lot of different skills. So I think that this is part of the answer, and the EU has already uh, taken this strategy, or at least parts of the EU, to, to create data stewards, if you will, that, that help, uh, help um, document and create data along the way. I would say there's also a really strong need to implement planning ahead of time, to really start a study and its planning process with the idea that this is one of the core products that you're sharing, because it changes the nature of what you choose to do along the way. And some of these tools are really important for making that easier. Okay, one last question, then we're going to have to stop. Um, but Sarah, please feel free to answer the other ones um, when you have a moment. So it says, Professor Nusser, is there a bit of this disconnect between what Coalition, Coalition S is emphasizing, so OA for articles, and what researchers are interested in? Broader, easier access to data. Um, that's from Adam. Yeah, um, let's see. I, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. I just, uh, I, I would say that generally that we still kind of have pubs and data divided um, and that you can consider these as different kinds of fronts and moving, uh, moving the whole open science landscape forward. Okay, well, Sarah, we're out of time. Thank you very much. I do appreciate all your comments and your willingness to participate today. It was great, thanks. Thank you. Over to you, Brooks. Uh, thank you, Howard, and thanks, Sarah. Um, so uh, what a great setup for our next exciting panel discussion on the uh, state of public access and the US funder perspective. Um, I'd like to, uh, briefly frame it and then uh, we'll get straight into the presentations and I'll let each panelist introduce themselves um, to save a little time and, and a lot more time for questions also. But uh, we have uh, key leaders here um, on the panel from four uh, agencies that have played a really important role in the evolution of open science, uh, both open data and open access uh, to publications. And I'd just like to pull one thread uh, that's been going through this, and particularly in Sarah's uh, talk, which is the um, key symbiotic uh, role um, played by all the all the stakeholders in here. And where we've had um, great success is when those stakes, they, the the stakeholders have worked together and collaborated uh, for open science. And um, Sarah and others have mentioned the 2013 OS, OSTP memos that at least in the US helped frame some of the discussion on open data and uh, public access uh, to other research uh, outputs. Um, but the history of that collaboration and the experimentation goes way back and these agencies have been key parts of that. For example, um, uh, Archive, uh, the, one of the largest preprint servers now was started at the Department of Energy. Um, and it was the collaboration of researchers, societies, publishers, um, and actually the funder that uh, allowed that growth um, uh, and kind of that experimentation. Um, similarly, the lessons learned from that um, influenced the development of PubMed Central and, and again, kind of the cooperation and deposition has helped PubMed Central growth. On the data side, uh, publishers and um, repositories working together, for example, with GenBank or PDB, um, really led to uh, kind of the growth and the understanding of, of some of the value of open data um, and also how uh, the, the role of repositories. Um, other agencies here, NSF in particular, have been uh, key in funding some of those uh, data repositories across the sciences um, and so forth. So, Hopefully some of those threads can be um, 
emphasized further in some of these presentations and the discussion afterwards. So uh, just to dive right in. Uh, so the first presentation will be by uh, Katie Funk um, from PubMed Central and the National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health. Over to you, Katie. Thank you, Brooks. Um, hi, everyone. I am very cognizant of the fact that we're trying to get through a lot of presentations quickly. So I just want to say thank you again. Um, and as the program manager for PMC, I wear many hats, but public access is perhaps my favorite. So I'm excited to be here and um, I will try to keep things within five minutes. And just harking back to where we started today, uh, I will be talking about public access very much so in sort of that traditional definition that Dan mentioned um, in his presentation. Uh, NIH does not have a open access policy per se, so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, next slide. A quick introduction to who I am representing. NIH is the medical research agency within the US federal government. So it includes the National Cancer Institute, NIAD, which Dr. Fauci is the head of, and the National Library of Medicine, where I work among many other institutes and centers. Annually, we fund uh, tens of thousands of awards in addition to supporting an intramural research program. And out of this work comes more than 100,000 peer reviewed papers that report on research supported by N NIH annually. Next slide. These papers that we collect are made available to the public under the NIH public access policy, which really represents NIH's longstanding commitment to making the research it supports available to the public. This policy has been around for more than a decade now, and it, though it predates that sort of fair doctrine that we frequently refer to um, in context of data sharing these days, the basic requirements it lays out are very much consistent with those principles. Uh, it requires that peer-reviewed manuscripts accepted for publication in a journal be made findable in the public repository of PubMed Central. Those papers must be made accessible to the public within 12 months of publication. By virtue of inclusion in PMC, all of these papers are archived in an interoperable and machine-readable format. The manuscripts we collect are then made available for text mining, and the published version of articles may also be available for further reuse depending on the license the publisher sets. Next slide. To date, more than 1 million papers have been made accessible to the public via PMC under this policy, and that represents a compliance rate of around 90%. Those papers have been accessed more than a billion times and demonstrate the impact that this type of public access model can really have on discovery and access to publicly funded research. And I think really the question at NIH now is how can we extend this sort of successful fair type of framework to data. Next slide. To start addressing that question, NIH released a draft policy for data management and sharing in November of last year. Uh, under this policy, individuals and entities would be required to provide a data management and sharing plan prior to even initiating a study. And that plan would be expected to describe how their scientific data would be managed, including when and where it would be preserved and shared. Further, the draft policy outlined NIH's expectations that data should be made accessible in a timely manner. Um, this policy is really building and expanding on the 2003 data sharing policy that we have in place right now, which only applies to very large grants. I think it's about $500,000 or more. This policy, this draft um, that's still under consideration would apply to all research funded or conducted by NIH that results in the generation of scientific data. Uh, next slide. In the context of this draft plan, NIH defines scientific data as the recorded factual material necessary to validate and replicate research findings, regardless of whether the data are used to support scholarly publications. And I think it's really critical that the definition of the data divorce itself from publications, but we have been finding that looking at publications can provide a snapshot of how data are currently being shared with NIH research. So next slide. This is a sort of high level look at papers in PMC that have been collected under the public access policy over the last 10 or so years. And they indicate that we've seen a trend toward more supplementary material being shared, which is represented by the gray portion of the bar, as well as an increase in the inclusion of data availability statements in articles. And those are represented by the two blue sections of the bars, the dark blue being data availability statement only, the lighter blue being a data availability statement and supplementary material. 
And further analysis that we've undertaken um, in NLM has found that the most common place that those data availability statements are pointing to is actually back to the supplementary material. So it's kind of cyclical right now as to how we're seeing a lot of the data being shared with publications. Um, we're taking this knowledge and undertaking efforts now to better understand what type of data exactly is being made supplemental to articles, how we can make that content more fair, and how we can encourage greater adoption of machine readable data sharing statements. Uh, next slide. Finally, um, as we're looking at open access in a global context today, even though your panel is all US funders, um, I wanted to briefly acknowledge how uh, we're looking to leverage the infrastructure of PMC that we've built over the last 20 years to support the larger ecosystem of funder policies and also to streamline compliance for researchers as much as possible. So very quickly, um, we've partnered with 10 federal agencies and numerous U.S. private funders to provide manuscript submission and public access support via PMC. Um, we have created the PMC International Network, which supports the policies of more than 30 funders outside the U.S. via Europe PMC. And we're also in the process of setting up redistribution channels for manuscripts identified by other funders as falling under their policies um, when, when multiple policies are applicable. So uh, last slide. That's just really a quick um, and very dirty overview of where NIH is currently at. And so being cognizant of time, I'll turn it over. Um, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions in the Q&A or, or via email. Katie, thank you very much. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning of this that please stay around after the session because Alex will be back um, with some closing thoughts and wrap up as well. So um, our next... Uh, the speaker is Andrea Medina-Smith from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Andrea. Good morning, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me and see me all right? Well, we don't really have to see me, but um, this morning I'd like to give just a quick overview of what NIST has been doing over the past eight plus years now to um, open up and give public, the public access to our, our research outputs. Next slide, please. So NIST, quickly at a glance, um, we are the US's uh, metrology institution. Um, and so that means that we help do things like redefine the kilogram and other um, basic measurements. We do a lot with measurements, but we also do a lot of work with um, manufacturing across the United States, cybersecurity, um, we have 10 collaborative institutes. We've got uh, over 7,000 people working with us um, to get all of this done across two campuses and um, about four other locations where we have a few researchers at a time. The vast majority of our work is, we call it intramural. We um, fund our own research. We do have a small percentage that is um, awards and grants, but um, the majority of what I'm talking about is gonna be for NIST employees. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, these are our laboratory pro programs and user facilities. We have the material measurement lab, physical measurement lab, um, and that researchers from that lab helped with the redefinition of the kilogram over the past decade or so. The engineering laboratory that does things like not only um, creating standards for engineering processes and the like, but also they will go in and look at disaster responses such as Hurricane Maria or the Joplin tornado, even the World Trade Center, we had a response there. The Information Technology Lab works with cybersecurity standards and the like. Our Communication Technology Laboratory is the newest lab, and what that lab does is looking at standards for um, cell phones, for um, uh, transmission data, all that sort of stuff. And finally, the NIST Center for Neutron Research, um, where that is a user facility, so researchers can propose uh, experiments to do on the different beam lines there at the research center and then they come in do them and um, produce lots of data that way. Next slide please. So public access for NIST researchers. Uh, for papers, uh, public, excuse me, peer-reviewed articles um, go into PMC. We have a partnership with Katie Funk's group um, and we help the researchers by making that initial submission for them. 
Technical reports are archived in GPO's GovInfo repository, and that's because they, um, since they're not peer reviewed in a traditional peer review way, uh, they um, can't go into PMC. So, uh, one other thing that we put into the GovInfo is a compendium each fiscal year of conference reports. So, if people are looking for our conference reports and they want to copy um, or conference. Uh, abstracts, proceedings, that sort of thing, um, they can look in our GovInfo repository and that's where those go. For data, on the other hand, uh, we have developed a taxonomy for different types of data, which helps the researchers decide what pub public access requirements apply. So working data straight off of a machine uh, doesn't have any public access requirements. If it is a standard reference data set, it's got a full suite of um, you know, it needs to be publicly accessible in a publicly accessible place. It has to be reviewed. It has to um, go through lots and it has to be preserved in one of our preservation systems. Data is published via our internal repository, but it can be posted to secondary locations once we have a copy of it um, so that we can maintain that over time. Next slide, please. Was that all my slides? No, there we go. And then uh, for the small amount of grantees that we have, there's uh, two ways to satisfy this. The vast, vast majority are publishing in a chorus member journal and that meets our public access requirements. The very few that aren't publishing in those non-chorus journals, we are working with PMC to figure out how to make those accessible. Um, and that's an ongoing process. We, again, have very few that aren't, so it's not like, you know, there's a hundred articles that are accessible to the public or anything like that. Um, it was interesting to me that NIH has explicitly called out that data not associated with a publication is covered. Ours doesn't, ex our definition of data does not explicitly call that out, but we do encourage everyone to publish as much data as feasible um, because either you're going to need that data yourself later and we want to have a copy accessible to you or you'll have colleagues who'd like to use it later or the general public may be interested in it and our anything with a record in our public repository gets sent to data.gov as well and so it's accessible and uh, findable from many different sources so our next moves will be looking at how to make our data more fair um, Again, that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable. So that's where our efforts are focusing right now. Great. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, next up is uh, Beth Paley and uh, Martin Hubbard at the National Science Foundation. Over to you, Beth. All right. Thank you. I'm assuming my video will pop up here. Can people hear me okay? Great. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, Beth Pleley, I'm with the National Science Foundation. I'm working on public access. Martin Halbert has just joined NSF and in the public access space and he is also um, on the um, on the call today and can participate as he wishes in the in the Q&A. Next slide, please. So the National Science Foundation, uh, for people who, who may not know, I expect people are generally familiar with it, is about an eight billion dollar a year funding agency that funds uh, extramural research, 95% of its budget roughly goes out in extramural funding um, every year. And it is funding across the sciences. It is not in the health space, that's NIH's purview, but it, it, it covers, you know, from astronomy to uh, genomics to computer science and engineering and, 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 and education and so on. Uh, NSF has had uh, you know, its public access uh, plan is in response to the, the OSTP memo that was uh, mentioned by Dan early on. Uh, its public access plan began in 2015. Its data management plans predate that. Its data management plans have been required since 2011. The philosophy behind those is an acknowledgement that the sciences across the directorates, which are just broken up in a discipline way, are, are, very, are varied, thus the, um, the, the, the data management plan guidance also needs to be at the directorate level. So the, the agency allows for that guidance to be at the directorate level. 
And then also it pushes the, the uh, review of that into peer review on the acknowledgement that it's really the communities that know best how to assess the viability of a data management plan. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the manifestation of, um, of, the, of public access um, within the agency, um, you know, uh, we, we, we fund activities, um, Sarah Nusser in her talk mentioned um, some of the activity that we, that we funded. Uh, the internal manifestation, the infrastructure manifestation of public access in the agency is, the, is a public access repository. The, uh, its, its existence today, which I'm calling 1.0, is that it, it accepts author-approved manuscripts, or accepts demands, author-approved manuscripts uh, that are submitted by the PI at annual and final reporting time. So as, as a, a PI is going through that process of their reporting, they will upload their author-accepted manuscript uh, into the public access repository. Because of the OSDP memo, these are available after a 12-month embargo. Uh, we have had the requirement went into effect January 2016 for, for awards that were funded after January 26, 2016. And we have had 50,000 publications deposited to date. So we're still relatively new at this. And we're still on the ramp up with respect to uh, hitting a steady state with respect to deposits um, as, 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 we, as we expect. So where are we going with this? Next slide, please. Uh, we are undertaking an expansion of the public access repository, and, and this is the agency's move on trying to address the other products uh, beyond uh, peer-reviewed uh, jour uh, journals and peer-reviewed conference proceedings. So we are expanding uh, NSF PAR to capture metadata information about the research products beyond the journals and jury conference proceedings, starting with data in support of publications. As Sarah mentioned, this is, this is a place to start. It's not, it, it's full recognition. It's not, it is just a start. Uh, and and as, as is the agency's way, reporting will, will be voluntary to start. So we feel like this, this, this step uh, provides benefits and that it gives greater discovery and access to the, the products of, of NSF research. I should point out that, it, that we are capturing the metadata information, discovery metadata information about the research products. We are not capturing all of the metadata that are needed for reuse and nor are we intending to be a repository for the data itself. We're relying on, on existing repositories uh, for in the repository landscape as the, the venues for, for, the, for the actual data um, itself. So again, so the, the, uh, the benefits to this is the uh, greater discovery, uh, greater kind of compliance and accountability for our own accounting. Uh, to improve that, and then also uh, this and what being built in is the ability to have greater control over accomplishments. Uh, the researcher, the PI, having greater ability over their own accomplishments, and with as with respect to NSF, as keeping that record and making it available. Next slide, please. So, so, so to the point of yes, we recognize that data in support of publication is, 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 is a part of the landscape. So I just want to take two slides and, and, and give you a little bit of a purview in terms of how we think about that landscape. So, and, and, and this I should say is, is um, driven by conversations that, that the agencies have regularly in an OSTP uh, subcommittee. It's an NSTC, which I don't know the acronym to, uh, I do, but I won't, I won't run it off to you. Subcommittee on Open Science. So we have regular conversations and ongoing discussion here. So this thinking, I, I give credit to our interagency discussions for this. Uh, so okay, so the so we re the agency recognizes that that it it captures and collects uh, scientific research data and does this through a number of venues. Next slide, please. And what this this uh, diagram is capturing is uh, the kinds of 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 places where data exist. And, and it gives examples down the right-hand side of each one of these, these rectangles. It is not to say that these are NSF, these are not NSF owned, and perhaps some, in some ways not even NSF funded, but this is where NSF data resides, and it resides in these number, these different types of solutions. So 
At the top, we've got observational networks, and this is where the data is coming in at high velocity. Um, and, and the expertise needed to, to analyze the data, it's, it's again, it's important that it need to be accessed right away. So the timeliness is very, very important. Down at the bottom, we have repositories. There's a couple different kinds. Those, those that are based around a discipline, specialist repositories, those that are more general in nature, what I'm calling generalist repositories, not my terminology, but specialist versus generalist repositories. And then in the, in the middle of this, you have these data portals where the data are arriving. It's lower velocity data, but still um, the co-location of data and compute is, is important for timely analysis. So I make uh, just a couple observations shown on the right-hand slide, and then I will, I will have one more slide here. So again, at the top of this chart, timeliness, the ability to make sense of this data as quickly as possible is important. The researcher depth of expertise, the expectations on, on the, the expectations of curation are lower because it's important to get to the data more quickly. As you drop down, there's an expectation of data longevity, and there's an expectation of higher level of curation. Uh, next slide, final slide here. And so there's two more observations here. And one of them at the top is that there's an optimization for timeliness on the research that could really suggest lower value over time. You know, if it's, if it's valuable in five seconds, is it really valuable in 50 years? Mm, maybe not. So it, it introduces a dimension of, of data value and longevity that I think bears some thinking and some conversation. And then the final point is in the bottom part of this slide, there's a, the, the general, the specialist and generalist repositories is generally the, the publisher's view of the landscape and the general public's view of the landscape. So perhaps there's discovery mechanisms that are harmonious across these lower levels and not the upper levels. So I think this framework allows for thinking about data, the different types of data and their needs I'm in, you know, in a way that certainly informed our thinking within the agency, and I hope more generally. Uh, next slide. So thank you. Great, thanks Beth. And uh, next up is Carly Robinson from the Department of Energy. Carly? Hello, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm in the Department of Energy's Office of Scientific and Technical Information. Um, as you all may be familiar, uh, the Department of Energy funds about $13 billion each year in R&D funding. Um, and that goes out uh, primarily externally to our 17 DOE national laboratories and to grantees at uh, universities and other institutions. So on the next slide, just wanted to set a little bit of frame uh, around kind of what we're talking about on our public access plan in response to the OSTP memo that came out in 2013. So the Department of Energy released our public access plan in July of 2014, addressing both the publications and data requirements. On the publication side, it requires that all researchers receiving DOE funding are required to submit the metadata and a link to the full text accepted manuscript within their institutional repository or the full text Excel to our office. And that requirement went into effect in October of 2014. And then we're making all of those um, accepted manuscripts or the best available version through our partnership with Chorus available in our search tool DOE pages. On the data side of things, the requirement is for all research proposals selected for funding to have a data management plan. And there's some requirements about what the data management plan needs to entail. Um, that went into effect um, for the Office of Science within the Department of Energy in October of 2014, um, but it went uh, into effect department-wide in October of 2015. So next slide. So I'm going to primarily talk about um, publication implementation because that is where my office is focused, but I'll also briefly mention our data management plan implementation. So on the publication side, um, we feel like uh, we're doing very well, especially within the DOE 17 national laboratories in terms of their compliance with the publications part of the public access plan. So you can see, um, you know, they have continued to increase their comprehensiveness in the publications and the accepted manuscripts that they're submitting to us since this policy went into effect in FY15. Um, the median right now across all 17 national labs is over 75%. So they're, they're really doing wonderfully. 
On the grantee side of things, um, you know, uh, for grantees at universities and other institutions, we still have some work to do there. So we are working with the various funding offices to make sure that um, the requirements and the policies uh, are, are understood by the grantees and that they understand that they should be submitting their accepting manuscripts and metadata to us. So briefly on the data side, um, things are going well with our data management plan policies, um, but the office that leads that effort is looking at kind of evaluating the current policy and um, the suggested elements of a data management plan um, with respect to kind of more broadly what's happening across the US government. So as Beth mentioned, there's the subcommittee on open science where agencies are, are working together and you know talking about uh, their public access policies and looking at the suggested elements for a data management plan. So we're evaluating um, that and guidance as well. So next slide. So not only did I want to mention what we're doing in terms of specifically what's in our public access plan, but I wanted to talk about our approach to open science a little bit more broadly, um, and especially around the use of persistent identifiers. Um, so we really think that this is key to um, understanding the impact of uh, DOE funding and really creating connections throughout the research lifecycle. So we offer a number of persistent identifier services. Um, so starting with services around DOI assignment, we offer DOI assignment for DOE funded data sets, software, technical reports, uh, instruments, and we're starting with a new service assigning Crossref DOIs to awards using the Crossref grant ID uh, metadata service. We're also launching a new service assigning DOIs to conference posters and presentations. We are the leads of the U.S. Government ORCID Consortium that launched in April of uh, 2020. So, you know, we're really encouraging the use of ORCID IDs across the Department of Energy, but there are also a number of other agencies um, who are using ORCID IDs and are either have joined or are interested in joining the consortium. And we're also doing work using research organization registry IDs. So we have an internal organization authority and we're working to map that authority to RUR IDs. So if you go to the next slide. So really the end goal of assigning all of these persistent identifiers and including that information in, in our systems is creating connections throughout the research life cycle to show the impact of DOE funding. So we wanna connect through the use of persistent identifiers, uh, funding grants to researchers, to the research and sponsoring organizations and to all of the research output. So really trying to cre create this network of connections using persistent identifiers. And if you go to the next slide, we're already doing work in this space and based on the new persistent identifier services we'll be um, offering soon, we're, we're trying to do even more. So this is a journal article record that we have in OSTI.gov, which is our primary search tool for all DOE funded R&D results. And on this journal article, you can see that um, one of the authors of this article has their ORCID ID associated with it. Ideally, we're, we're looking to have all of the authors have their ORCID IDs associated with it. And if that information is provided to Crossref, we're pulling that in. In the future, we are looking at connecting RUR IDs um, to research organizations and to sponsoring organizations and connect Crossref DOIs to the grant contact, contract information we have. And on the next slide, we're also doing a lot of work currently um, connecting DOIs to research outputs. So for this journal article, um, we're connecting the DOIs to other journal articles um, through its references. So we've connected this journal article to, I think it's um, 43 other journal article references. And on the next slide, we are connecting this journal article also to other outputs. So in this case, to data sets, figures, and collections associated with our, this article. And I will leave it there. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much, Carly. So uh, again, to all the attendees, feel free to type a question into the Q&A, and I'll try to uh, get to as many as we can. Uh, while we're doing that, let me ask uh, a first question. Uh, many of you mentioned the 2013 OSDP memos, which were two, one on open data and one on open access uh, journal uh, author copies. Um, in the past, well, earlier this year, uh, uh, OSTP, the current OSTP, uh, reached out and had two RF uh, 
two RFIs and a variety of discussions with stakeholders, again, when sort of on data, desirable characteristics of research, um, data repositories, and then one more on open science, but uh, a little slanted or more focused on open access to publications. Many of the attendees on this conference submitted responses to both, um, in particular the second one, but many also to both. Um, so from your perspective as funders, could you say either some of the, your thoughts on that or the con conversations with OSTP or how would, how would you like this taken forward to, to look forward? Um, Beth, could we start with you on that and perhaps go around? Yeah, and the, um, you know, I think the, the, the subcommittee on open science has certainly, um, you know, had a, a, a large um, hand in, in, in that, in the RFIs and is um, discussing the, uh, was pleased with the response and is, is discussing in multiple set sessions the, the, the responses from it. Um, and then I'll, I will reiterate the, the, that these interagency meetings, you know, there's a strong commitment to, to, uh, to you know, there, there's acknowledgement that we're, we're, we're we, we acknowledge the, the uh, research, the reducing barriers, researcher barriers, and we acknowledge some of what we've been hearing in the community and in, in terms of harmonization, and, and Carly mentioned harmonization across data management plans. And so these, these topics are, 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 are rich, and the, this type of feedback through the RFI is, is, is definitely being, being seen and listened to. Great, thanks Beth. Uh, any of the other panelists wanna comment on that? I, I can see you also either just raise your hand and I'll call you or, or speak up. Okay, great. Um, second question, and you can always add on. Uh, you, can, you can go a little rogue on another question if you want to come back to an earlier one. Um, kind of the second question is that, and this came up this morning uh, a little bit on the international uh, thoughts, funding thoughts on preprints, and just how do how do preprints fit, in your view, from your agencies, fit into the landscape? of open science. Um, so Katie, why don't, why don't you start this one? Sure. Um, so preprints at NIH, they're not subject to the, the policies. So I, I, that's why I kind of sidestepped them in my presentation. But since 2017, they have been um, an area that NIH has been encouraging investigators to, to post um, and to post publicly with a CCBY license. Uh, they've provided guidance on how to cite them as products of award as well as in applications. And the hope is that by sharing early uh, research results, they can um, both expand the, maximize the impact um, as well as get that early feedback and increase collaboration. Uh, what we've done most recently is sort of focusing in on that maximizing impact of NIH research that's posted to preprints is look at how we can increase the discoverability of them. And so at NLM, we are right now piloting um, inclusion of preprints that are identified with NIH support um, in PubMed Central and by association then PubMed. We're in phase one of this pilot. Uh, it's expected to run for at least 12 months. Um, this plan was conceived before the world changed uh, a good deal. So, um, I think we're going to have to see where science is in 12 months to see if we have enough data to determine whether to continue the pilot or not. But right now in phase one, we are um, putting in COVID-19 related re uh, preprints with NIH support. There are about 700 right now. Um, they are discoverable alongside the peer reviewed literature, uh, but they're clearly identified as not peer reviewed. And we're kind of seeing how it goes, but this is an area that uh, NIH is at least interested in supporting, um, even if it's outside the bounds of its policy. And I think that's clear by the policies that uh, both the HEAL initiative and the NCI Moonshot initiative put out in the last few years, which reference preprints with CCBY licenses as a way of uh, getting your research results out and open fast. Great. Uh, any of the other panelists want to comment? Carly? I'll, I'll... And Carly and then Beth, and then we'll go. 
So I would just echo a lot of what um, Katie was saying, um, you know, that it doesn't fall within our public access plan, but, you know, there's a lot of interest in preprints and it's something that we're continuing to explore how to make those um, more discoverable and publicly accessible. Um, so my office has a history going all the way back to the Manhattan Project making um, all of the R&D results coming from Department of Energy as publicly available as possible. And so that includes not just data and publications, um, peer reviewed publications, but um, any other form of research results, um, including preprint. So it's, it's something we're actively uh, exploring, um, but we haven't quite taken the step yet that NIH has, but I think it's a great example for us to look at and learn from. Great, Beth. Yeah, so I will, I'm acknowledging the same as what Carly and, and Katie have said that, that preprints do not fall under the, the, our, our public access plan. Um, however, they are reported at, at annual final report time. So we do have record of them, but, but I would just put in a plug for CHORUS here in that CHORUS is, is giving back information to the agencies about content that is citing the agency. And, and so we have that information from, from another source that I think is, is there's a lot of potential there. Um, and I think that's, that's, it will increasingly, that information will increasingly play a larger role in how we think about uh, the, the, the content that is, that credits uh, NS, uh, NSF awards, which, which we're very interested in as a whole. Great. So I'm going to pull uh, probably a couple threads together from, from a couple of the questions. Um, Andrea, and I think I'll, I'll throw this to you, and which I'll explain why in a second. But uh, it's broadly, you know, there's been a lot of, of talk both in this session throughout this whole, this whole day, but particularly the last two um, sessions on uh, data and, um, you know, the important role that that open data plays in science. And, uh, you know, uh, there's been broader discussion also about how do we actually support the data infrastructure. I think there's wide recognition among, you know, when you talk to repositories or uh, researchers and so forth on and funders that we need to invest globally in the uh, re research infrastructure better than we are now. So what's, what's your perspective on kind of the federal investment uh, needed um, for sustainable deal infrastructure and what role do you see the agencies playing and Andrea I know NIST in particular has been trying to come up with some standards across the sciences on metadata standards and things like that to help this along so um, that was the logic of, of starting with you on this question okay so um, first let me say that this is my perspective as sort of the tie between the people who are building the infrastructure and the researchers themselves sitting in a library. Um, I'm not speaking per se for NIST, but what I see the agencies being able to do is really uh, create or invest in not only the standards, but the infrastructure that then hopefully through our ties via funding or um, with states and state universities and the like, being able to then, you know, have to help roll out effective infrastructure beyond just the federal agencies. Um, you know, what I see is researchers saying, oh, I really need to do this, and us not and they not having the path or knowing who to talk to within our infrastructure teams about how to get those um, requirements onto the list. So um, I, I think that the, the place of those of us in the sort of administrative in-between zones, not necessarily in a library, but in this administrative in-between zones, can really be working more and more with the researchers to write better um, requirements for those who are building the infrastructure. And then on the flip side to that, um, those of us who have had success building this sort of stuff within the agencies can be helping to guide and lift up smaller agencies that haven't had as much success with that. So that's what I'd like to see. And you know, both Beth and Carly have talked about the um, NSCC subcommittee on open science, and that's what a lot of those conversations are about. How do we make sure that all of the agencies within the government are able to provide this, these sort of services. Um, DOE, I think, is a great example of creating uh, coalitions and consortia among them, among agencies. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my thought on that. Great. Uh, Beth? 
Um, Carly had her hand up though. Oh, Carly okay. So, yeah. so Carly. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just to kind of build on that, I definitely think, um, you know, we're exploring what Department of Energy's role should be in various infrastructures. So I, I'll maybe hit on Mark's question in the chat too with this. So, you know, DOE has a long history of building uh, physical research infrastructure at our DOE user facilities. There's a lot of equipment there. And so we're really trying to kind of build on the work that's already done there. And so my office works very closely with the DOE facilities, especially around our persistent identifier services. Um, so there's a lot of work already on kind of re reporting around what's coming out of the facilities, but we're trying to tie that to persistent identifiers. So assigning DOIs to the data that comes out of the facilities, assign award DOIs to what they're awarding and really kind of create this larger um, persistent identifier infrastructure. And then on the, the kind of data repository infrastructure side, a lot of that, that infrastructure already lives within the DOE National Laboratories and the facilities. And so we're kind of evaluating if additional infrastructure is needed for kind of the grantee community. Others? I have a, yeah. oh, go ahead, Beth. Yeah, and then, yeah, I would just add, and this is just re just reiterating something that I had said in my talk, but, but in the, the data landscape slide that I showed with the, the specialist and the generalist repositories, you know, NSF is funding significantly across this, this entire data landscape. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of heterogeneity across the, the specialist and generalist repositories with respect to discovery. And I think, even, and this is some of the conversations we've had in, in the subcommittee that, that even a certain harmonization just at the discovery layer, which can be done fairly minimally, I think would give the perception of, 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 of discovery that's much greater than, than it is today. So I, I do think there are, I think we're partway to, uh, to a solution. Um, and, and I should also say the step that we made that the National Science Foundation made with respect to data and supportive publications and putting those metadata records in PAR is, is a major step forward for us. Um, and, and I think that may, that may illuminate gaps as that starts to become a, a reality that we'll, we'll need to act on. Um, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, we're aware of the issue. We're certainly aware of the concerns. We're aware of the objections that are being raised by the community and are, and are, are grappling with them. Um, Katie, did you, I couldn't tell if you had your hand up or no. I, I don't think I have anything of great value to add. A, a quick follow up. Um, you know, one idea that's come up that might help support this uh, is more universally, you know, raising the expectation of kind of a data management overhead um, in the grants or, or a line item in the grants or in, in most of the grants that are generating data, either that or as part of the data management plan. Um, is that something you all are actively thinking about and or supporting. Yes, Carly? We'll just hit all, you can be quick sure. across all the agencies. <laughs> um, so I, I think that we're definitely interested in that. It, it's interesting if you talk to the researchers in various communities, some communities will say that the funding we give them is almost 100% data management already, right? Everything they do is data management. So I think a lot of this is just understanding where various communities that we fund are coming from and what they kind of define as data management to see kind of um, what additionally could, could be added into those types of requests. Uh, do we just wanna go around Katie? Sure. So as to whether or not it's it's going to be a line item, I'm, I can't speak to you, quite honestly. I would be making it up. But um, I mean, right now for public access to publications, it is an allowable expense. Now, whether it would be added in or just part of how you can choose to use your funding um, it remains to be seen. And, and much like Carly um, said, it it's so, and this is, I think is why NIH is still in some <laughs> kind of ambivalent draft zone uh, this long after the 2013 OSTP memo is it's so variant by by field. I mean, we know genetics has a very well established um, data sharing culture as well as a lot of the the NCBI databases are, are something they're already relying on it and free to to use. Um, so I think it's going to be an ongoing effort, especially as we, if you get those DMPs in though, it, there can be an honest conversation about the likely costs. And, and so that's really where this needs to start for us. 
Okay. And I, I agree. And I agree with what Katie is saying that, yes, we, you know, those kinds of expenses are already allowable costs and we've made efforts to get that word out to people so they know that. But I do think the, you know, putting a, a, a bar at that saying it's 5% or, or 10%, I think is nice because it does allow us to quantify, potentially quantify kind of a ceiling on what the overall cost is. So I think in that sense, I think it's useful. It's got a lot of practical problems uh, when, when one looks at the diversity of, of awards that are actually given out by an agency. Great, Andrea, any thoughts? Yep. So kind of one last wrap up question, if you could be very quick, what would be, uh, there's a lot of the attendees on from publishers and societies. So if there's one thing you could ask of, of publishers, um, you know, top, top one, not even top 10, um, and it, what would it be? And then we'll close up with that. And Andrea, you can go first. Great. Thank you. Uh, I would love to require data availability statements so that we can say, you're publishing. It's required to have this availability statement. Let's just post, publish it via our, um, our repository. You get a persistent identifier. It's citable. It's usable. Um, that's what we would request from publishers. Uh, along with data citations, probably. Yes, so. along with data citations. Um, are you all second that? Is, is that, is that all the top one for, for one of you or any, anybody else? Curly, okay. go ahead. And then Beth. I would just kind of broaden that to persistent identifiers generally and sharing the metadata, all of the metadata you possibly can with Crossref or whoever is assigning that persistent identifier, because I really think that's the next step is, you know, creating persistent connections between all of this work. Beth? Yes, and I would just say in our movement with PAR 2.0, data in support of publications, the expectation is that data is a first class citizen, so it has a persistent ID and, and lives independently. Great. Katie, you get the last word. Yeah, um, I would, well, I would just first, not a, a request, but a thanks to all the publishers and societies online because without them, public access at NIH would not have been as successful as it has been. Um, and. Uh, I have to like quadruple everyone's requests about um, data availability statements and preferably machine readable data availability statements that point to a, a P PID. Um, that would be wonderful. And if you are going to, to make the content, the data supplementary to the article, then let's figure out a way to assign metadata to that. Great. Thank you all for a great discussion. And Howard and Alex, back to you all. Great. Thank you. Hi there, sorry, I'll take myself off mute. So can you all see, no, it doesn't look like you can. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. Oh, shoot. Sorry, one second, please. Of course, it's going to be on my thing when I've got the technical difficulties. <laughs> Howard, if you like, I can talk about the next event while you're setting it up. Yep, here, here we go, actually, Alex. Alex I think we're good now. So what I wanted to just quickly be able to do is just give you all the, the results that we had from, from the poll. So we had 22 people that responded. <clears throat> um, and you can see here that the majority of them were publishers that responded, but we do have a variety of others that, that also have participated um, in, in the poll. The next question had to do with Plan S and whether or not there was enough information out there. Um, so um, obviously it's not, not 100%. So there's more information that people do need to, um, and they want about Plan S. Excuse um, me, how the, the poll results are not showing. The poll results are not showing? Okay, sorry. Uh -huh. Uh, there we go. How about now? There yes. they are. Okay, sorry about that. So uh, you can see here that uh, that there's not enough information about there about Plan S. So that's just a, a point that maybe uh, we can share with the Plan S people, um, and maybe even do some more information sharing from from the chorus side. 
then we asked whether or not, the, uh, as a publisher, are you on course to be aligned with Plan S by the end of 2020? And it was interesting here because you can see that only 26% of them would say yes, and then uh, about 30% said no, and then and then of course there are, there are others that are just are not publishers. So that 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 is part of the answer here. So we then we went into some questions about that might have to do with what Chorus could offer in the future, and we asked whether or not some organizations need help with identifying and tracking articles by authors from institutions with whom they have a read and publish agreement. And it looks like a lot of the publishers already have that covered, um, which is which is great. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be following up with with others who have said that they don't, so that uh, potentially we can explore things that we can do with them. Uh, data sets were the next has to do with the next question and linking to data sets. It was very clear from from this answer from these uh, 23 that we have in here that uh, data sets are important and I'm glad to say that chorus is heading in that direction. So we'll be following up more in that direction. And here we had a question about whether or not organizations need help with depositing gold VORs into the following repositories. And um, you can see the results are spread around um, quite a bit in here, which we'll be pursuing later. And um, then we asked whether or not there's interest in specific topics in upcoming chorus webinars. So um, it, interesting for me anyway, um, and we'll be studying this more carefully later, is about data access mandates and uh, best practices in article metadata. So um, those, are, those are things that we'll definitely be exploring. And, um, and then basically, we, our last question is, we asked people what challenges they're, they're facing with monitoring or meeting or facilitating OA or public access. And you can see here are some of the, the things that people have written in. So that's our, our, our poll. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to fill it out. Um, and uh, we'll be back to you with more information later about other later course events. Back to you, Alex. Super. Thank you. I can't turn on my video, but maybe Tara can. And But I am unmuted and I'll go ahead. So, wow, this was a great event, I think, and um, really, there you go, there I go. Um, I thank you all for attending. I hope you found it valuable. Um, I'd like to recognize and thank our speakers and panelists who did a tremendous job. I'd also like to thank Howard and Tara and the Chorus Forum Task Force for their hard work. Thank you again to our sponsors and to all of you for your uh, very interesting questions. And great news, we'd like to announce a next free webinar uh, to look forward to on September 17th. This one will be co-hosted with STM and the Center for Open Science and will be titled Towards a U.S. Research Data Framework. It'll include Bob Hennish from NIST and panelists from AGU, EMSL, and Virginia Tech. Uh, if you'd like to register right away, Registration is open, and we've shared a link in the Zoom chat. Um, in any case, thank you for joining us today, and have a wonderful rest of the summer. Greatly appreciated. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you.